Welcome to the First Time Facilitator Podcast. Whether you're a first time facilitator or a seasoned pro, listen in for tips and tricks to make a bigger impact at the next workshop you deliver. And now, your host, who's one of those who waves madly at the end of Zoom calls, Leanne Hughes. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm your host, Leanne Hughes, and I'm here to help you create unpredictable workshop experiences that predictably work. If you can hear some background noise, it's a little different from previous podcast episodes. It's because I'm at an Airbnb down the Gold Coast, staying across the road from the beach, which is amazing. There's also traffic that's going past, but I'm just looking out the window as I record this to just some beautiful waves crashing, um, which is nice. It's just nice to have a little mini vacay. Now, last week on the show, we had Meg Bolger talking all about workshop design and she shares a cool tool that she uses to plan her workshops. It's easy as putting something in your back pocket. And then if you need to pivot, giving everyone a break, pulling out these cards and thinking, okay, what process do we need to go through to keep this workshop moving in the right direction? Now, this week I'm talking to someone who has a very, well, very similar mission to me, but her audience is the higher education sector. Now, I remember university lectures, oh gosh, how long ago? 20 years ago, you'd get in, you'd sit down, you'd shut up and you'd listen for two hours. Uh, I'd always try to take notes, but I'd walk away Maybe I was possibly daydreaming in class, but I wouldn't remember too much of what exactly had happened in the lecture. Um, I'd really have to review notes and I, find, I found tutorials a lot more helpful for my learning. Dr. Barbie Honeycutt is my guest today and she works with professors, instructors, faculty development professionals, instructional designers, graduate students, postdocs and entrepreneurs who want to design engaging learning experiences. And isn't that all of us? All of us listening to the show anyway. Now, it's very challenging, as you know, to come up with new and creative ways to engage your students. So every day when you arrive or log into your classroom or virtual Zoom call, you are responsible for creating a space for students to learn from you and from each other. Barbie provides the structure, strategies, and support you need to engage students and improve learning. In this conversation, Barbie shares her experience with teaching others how to create engaging lectures and learning experiences, how she created a virtual summit, which drew hundreds of people. Uh, We drive into really good detail in this one. So, because I was very curious about running a virtual summit and what it took. So I asked a few questions on on this line. And she also shares how she built her facilitation business and gained exposure through one blog article. It can happen, folks. So for the last 19 years, Barbie has facilitated thousands of professional development events for educators at colleges and universities throughout the world. The resources that she provides are grounded in theory, informed by research and designed for practical application. I hope you enjoy this episode. You can find Barbie at barbiehoneycut.com. That's B-A-R-B-I, honey, H-O-N-E-Y, C-U-T-T.com. Connect with her on LinkedIn or listen to her podcast called Lecture Breakers. Very cool name, which I dive into again uh, in this episode. You can find all the details to contact Barbie over at firsttimefacilitator.com forward slash episode 147. Hey, once the conversation is over, join our community of over 1,100 facilitators from all over the world in the Flipchart Facebook group. Love to see you in there and share your thoughts on this episode. Okay, that's it from me. On to the show. I am delighted to welcome onto the First Time Facilitator podcast, Barbie Honeycutt. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. It's uh, it's funny how we met. It was through, we've just been talking about it, Pat Flynn's Community SPI Pro. And uh, when I saw what you did and, and actually how you've created a virtual conference, we'll talk about all of this as part of the show, but sure. for our listeners that, that haven't got the context that I have about you, Barbie, can you please share a bit about your story and how you discovered the work that you do today? Sure, sure. So um, I'm actually in higher education. Um, That's the audience that I serve. And so uh, I started um, working in higher education doing professional development workshops for professors. And so I was um, all about teaching them how to teach. And so, of course, you know, I had to learn the skills of how to be an effective facilitator, um, how to be an effective teacher and how to communicate that. And then, you know, I started as an intern in what's called a teaching and learning center on our campus and worked my way all the way up to director. Uh, But then right around 2011, I got that, you know, I don't know what you call it, that itch, that entrepreneurial itch and said, you know what, I want to try to take the work that I do for one campus and do it across the country and do it for other campuses. And so that's when I launched my business part time. And then in 2015, went full time with it. So that's what I've been doing ever since. 
Amazing. And you've got a podcast as well. I love, it's great talking I, to fellow podcasters. I love your audio. Yes. Um, so yeah, so I'm a, a speaker. So I, I, prior to COVID, I would travel a lot and speak a lot. Now I do a lot of webinars, um, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners do too. Uh, and I do have a podcast called Lecture Breakers and um, I'm an author uh, and consultant. So wearing all the hats. <laughs> You certainly are. I'm very impressed. And hopefully I can add author to my sort of list in the future. We'll talk about book writing as well later on. But um, so I love that that term lecture breakers. And it just signals so much to me. First of all, breakers is kind of like a little bit rebellious. Like we're going to break, I feel like they're going to break the rules. When I hear the word lecture, I I hear, you know, what it conjures up for me is what I was used to at university, which was, you know, you'd walk in, you'd sit down, you were spoken to for the hour or two. And if you were to quiz me, Barbie, on what I heard, I probably couldn't tell you much. I mean, I took notes, but it didn't really sink in. So lecture breakers, tell us more about that concept and, and what you teach people when you're teaching them how to teach others. Yeah. So you hit the nail on the head with a little bit of a a rebellious streak for the name. Um, The lecture, as we know, is just such a uh, sort of the gold standard for teaching. Unfortunately, that's the way everybody thinks that teaching is done is when you are talking at your audience or your learners and they're magically, you know, listening and absorbing it all and ready to spit it out on a test. But I wanted to go against that. That's just we, what we know about how people learn and how people, uh, how students learn and, and what we know about how, and what we're learning still about how the brain and the neuroscience and, and what we know about cognition, all of that. I just wanted to go against you know, the, the lecture. <laughs> and so, yeah. And so um, I, I wanted to talk, so my podcast, it, that's the name of it. And so I really wanted to talk to other educators out there who were breaking out their lectures, doing really creative and innovative things in, in this case, the college classroom. And I wanted to talk about, you know, what are some strategies you can go do? How can you get started in this? And that's kind of where it started. And, you know, I've, I have my podcast for a year and I love it. There's so many creative innovative faculty members and educators out there. And so I just want to share their stories. Oh, so cool. That's, that's actually the, the reason why I started mine. And mine was sort of targeted towards like uh, the corporate business side of people that run workshops and things like that. So you've got the higher education. It's a similar concept though. It's like, what are these people around the world doing? Let's capture those and share them with the world. So I yep. love that. Like That's like when I, when I saw your story on SPI Pro, I'm like, Barbie and I have got to talk. <laughs> well, yeah, I think we're, we're kindred spirits. I we guess are. we just do the same work in different in different niches. And so yeah. that, that's great. Yeah, it's so cool. So what are, like, what are some cool strategies that you've heard or things that you've tried yourself to break lectures up and make them more exciting? Um, well, so for your listeners, I wanted to leave some very specific things they could go try, especially if they're new, if they're first time facilitators, mm-hmm. of course. Um, the same thing that I tell, you know, professors is just not to try to change everything all at once. You know, if you you have a style and the way that you work, that's great. But if you can break it up every now and then, that's an amazing thing to do because it really helps with retention and engagement um, and motivation, you know, to finish, you know, an online course or a lecture. And so um, one strategy I like to use is called three, two, one. Um, So you literally just pause Well, you can do it at the end of a lesson or a module or a webinar, anything you want, or you can do it in the middle. Um, And I've even done it to kick it off if I had my audience do some kind of homework or pre event to work. Um, But you literally ask them, okay, give me three things that you learned. So they write that down or share that in some way. Two things that you already knew or that confirmed what you already knew, which is a really good question, because if you are especially working with, you know, adult learners or professionals in the field, they're already bringing that experience and you want to, you want to recognize that. Mm-hmm. And then finally, one question that they still have. And so that can really kick off some good discussion, some good activities and make sure you're taking the rest of your, you know, webinar or lecture or presentation in a different direction and the, the, the place that you need to go. So it's called three, two, one pretty simple the best activities are the simplest I'm actually so <laughs> right. now usually I have a notepad and pen to write down like notes and things I want to ask more questions on but I've wrote, written this down as something that because I've got a call coming up in a couple of hours and I'm just going to use it but like, it's so go. give it a try <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much three two one I love it yep so my question for you is um when you are working with people like professors that have for the, the whole lives just on a traditional format of lecturing Barbie comes in and like shakes up their world Right. What do you experience? Like, do you get any pushback? Like, how do you kind of, yeah, you do. (laughs) How does it go? 
so it's getting a little better, um, but yes. Yeah, so, um, so one thing is in, in higher education, and you probably see this as well in, in corporate types mm -hmm. of settings, you know, there is a tradition and there is a way things have always been done and you're coming in and you're pushing against that. So you have to really know your audience. I have found though, that in education, the professors that I work with, the audience, they really want to do the best job that they can. Mm -hmm. And they're amazing at what they do. And those that are still stuck in the, um, I call it the sage on the stage. I'm sure you've heard that model where, you know, you're this expert on the stage and there's your knowledge that you're passing on. <laughs> you know, they usually don't show up in my workshops, <laughs> um, you know, um, but the people who do come are really excited. They're open to learning. Um, they're ready to try something new, but I have found that I have to sometimes, um, show them the evidence first. So sometimes they need to engage with some type of, of you know, um, article that, that's been published recently or some data so they can start to see how it changes and transforms the learning experience for students. And speaking of students, um, there's resistance there as well. So, you know, when we talk about anything related to active learning or, you know, you're doing any kind of active facilitation, student-centered centered learning, anything like that, it's a new model for many students and they don't always understand why they're doing it and they don't see the purpose. And so there can be a lot of pushback from students and that student resistance is something that we have to talk through and figure out the strategies for because um, you know, they may not know their role they may not know what mm -hmm. they're supposed to be doing. Um, they may not know how to get that A in a course where we're doing all these activities. Um, they may not, they may have had really bad experiences with doing some really poorly designed interactive types of learning. And so they bring that into the classroom space. And I'm sure that happens in training and development as well. Big so, time. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm even reflecting, um, but I, I continue to say it on the show. I guess the reason my show is around is because workshops, team sessions have such a bad brand like right I, like the second someone gets an email about it, like oh we've got another team day it's like it's like ugh. so I guess as a facilitator that's kind of cool because the the expectation is so low and like I love what you said about it's just trying like one or two different things that can really have a huge impact and and but I've been in situations and this is like cross-cultural as well I've flown to um, sort of Asian countries where the first thing I've done is like right everyone stand up turn to each other and there's been like like what the heck like we were expecting right. us to come in here and just to listen for all day but you're gonna, you're making us so it's, it's interesting that you spoke about that that student side of things as well and and student I use the word student because I'm in a classroom education space but mm. you know replace the word student with learner or participant or audience member anything you you want to replace there with the type of facilitation that you do and you're going to find that you're going to find that pushback and that resistance or that hesitance I often call it hesitance because once they know what's expected of them and what the purpose is and they can see the value of it they jump right in you know and let's yes. go um, and that's another thing too that I really try to do in every single workshop or webinar I'm all always trying to, to, to model or practice what it is that I'm teaching. So if I'm talking about active learning and I never do any active learning, which is where you're doing that engagement piece, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, so I always want to, like you said, do activities, get them involved, let them see the purpose, then reflect back on that. And so by modeling that for them, it puts them in the position that their students would be in as the professor, and then they get a feel for, you know, where are they uncomfortable? What do they need to do? Where do they need more support? So that is another great way to do it as well. Yeah. Uh, there's, we have put a bit of pressure on ourselves. Like the fact that I run a podcast about facilitation, like the se second I'm in a <laughs> workshop, I'm like, okay, I'm really going to like, like, what am I doing here? There's like, that's actually not too much pressure because it's called first time facilitator, but still, yeah. And the fact that we do this for a, a living yeah, we've really got to yeah. role model it. Um, what I was curious about, you so you mentioned like the evidence-based side of things. I love that. And you've also touched on neuroscience as well. So how, I mean, that's in it's sort of an emerging field. I think uh, I follow David Rock's work. Mm -hmm. um, he's, yeah, I was actually, I didn't know that he was Australian. I heard him on a podcast. So I was like, oh, he's an Aussie living in New York, which is kind of cool. Um, neuroscience, what, what can we learn from neuroscience that, that will work in terms of keeping our, yeah, doing the active learning, getting people engaged in what we do? What, what have you sort well, of picked up from that? You know, I'm still learning. This is a space that I'm stepping into. And so I definitely don't feel like the expert on that. I do know I'm learning more about um, things like um, retrieval practice, where you give your student or your learner the opportunity to reflect back on what they've learned and figure out how they're going to use it. And we don't do that very often. We just sort of assume that just because we covered it, they got it. Um, yes. Or just because they passed the most recent quiz or the most pe recent performance review or whatever it is that's, you know, ever how you're assessing that. 
or measuring that, that they did it, but we don't often come back to it many, many months later and say, okay, let's, let's check this knowledge recall. Let's see what we're doing here. And so that's one thing I've been learning a lot more about. And there's just easy ways to do that. Even that three, two, one strategy is a way to do that. You're tapping into that, that prior knowledge, helping them make those connections and form, you know, their own mental model or schema around how they look at the world and how they make sense of it. And so again, I'm still, I feel like I'm such a newbie in this space, but the more I read, the more I see how the strategies connect to those and make those things visible. And so that's, that's kind of where, you know, my own professional development has been going over the last year or so. Yeah, me too. And that it's, it's a question I, that I always ask, like in this, is like, how do we, like we create this great environment, people are inspired, they're like, you know, ready to go. And then, then you let, let them go into the world and right. like that, I, I struggle with answering that question. I, I have strategies, but there's certain, I mean, like, how do you inspire that action? Uh, yeah. What are your thoughts yeah, on embedding? Is, it's tough. It is tough. And, and, you know, how do you know that they take action on it? So they come to a workshop for an hour or a day, you know, whatever your, your length is for your workshop, but it's a, it's a, it's a one-off event. You know, usually it takes place and then we go and we do our, whatever we do, we teach classes or we go back to work or whatever that, that is. And so, um, that transfer of that knowledge from that workshop is something that's sometimes very difficult to measure. And especially in education, sometimes we don't know if our students are going to use this stuff until they get in the job market, you know, until they're yeah, graduated yeah. and moved on, which could be three years from now. And so it's really hard to measure. Um, what I try to do at the end of a workshop, though, is I always try to give um, or in, in inspire people to try to take action in a way that we can see it in some way. Um, so one thing I might have them do is um, like I have a community built around my, my podcast. And so when I do a workshop or like when I did my conference this summer, I encourage them to come back and share with the community what they learned and how they used it. And they could earn a badge by doing that. And so, you know, if they could reflect on this is what I learned in the, in the conference this is how I changed my course. And this is what I did and how it worked. I'm like, great, let's give you a badge for that. And then I've been inviting those guests, uh, those um, participants to come on my podcast as a guest. And I do what I call a case study episode um, where we dig into, okay, what was your problem that you were having? Why did you want to change it in your classroom or your situation? And then, you know, what did you, what did you learn? Where did you learn that from? And then how did it go? <laughs> you know, and what would you change? And those have been, I've just sprinkled those into oh, my podcast. Awesome. Yeah, that's a great way, I think, to those who are really motivated to say, yes, I want to share my story and I was so successful at this and I want to talk about how I did it. That's become really popular, I think, and it's a great way for me to see what kind of impact that event has had. I love that. I love that format. It's um, And I keep sort of saying it when I started this podcast, everyone's like, first time facilitator, Leanne, you won't get over 50 episodes. Like it's, and I think I'm like close, close to 150 now. And there's just you new go. ideas. Yeah. And like, Bobby, like yeah. that's another, that's a new idea that I hadn't heard before. Plus it's like a cool format idea for the podcast. It's something maybe to try later on. I love that. Yeah, and a great way to inspire your, your audience and your learners to, to, you know, be involved and to help advance the knowledge because they are so creative. When I put them, when they come on the show, I'm just like, oh, I didn't even think about that. That's an amazing <laughs> idea. And that but if you don't, well, if you don't have a podcast, but you have some kind of community, inviting them to write a guest blog post in the same type of format, that's a case study, or to do a Q&A session for 15 minutes with you that you can then share with others, anything like that, where they can, you're kind of elevating their success and you're seeing how they've used it before and then, you know, sharing it with others, which is what we all want to do. Oh my gosh. So clever. Like you do things like, yeah, yeah. just hop, get on a LinkedIn live with them and chat to them and yeah, sure. video podcast. You could interview them, put on a podcast. Yeah. Yep. So for me, it's been the podcast platform. That's the space that I've been playing in. Yeah. Um, and then I have a, a Facebook group with them and some people will, you know, write something, they write something, you know, for their college or university and they share it with everybody and say, here's what I learned, you know? And so that's been amazing. Any kind of success stories, um, anything that just kind of makes that, that, that change that they had visible. Yeah. And, yeah. and celebrate, everyone celebrates along and, and then celebrate they, it and they can riff off the idea. It's so clever. Thank you for sharing that. Oh yeah, uh, you're welcome. So let's talk about your virtual conference. Cause I was really curious about that. So, so tell what, what was the context you, was it an in-person event that you pivoted to virtual or, or you just decided to put on a virtual event? Yeah. And then, the story's, the story's kind of cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, share it with us. 
So I launched my podcast in October, 2019. And then I sent all of my subscribers an email um, that I send every year. Um, I sent it in November and I, I just asked them, you know, what are the biggest challenges? Um, what are the things they have the most questions about? What do, want, what do they want to learn next? What kind of formats do they like to, you know, um, to learn? Do they like to read? Uh, attend webinars, attend, you know, whatever conferences, events, whatever. So I got this feedback. And so in December, I looked through the feedback and it said um, that a lot of my audience loved community. Like they wanted more opportunities for community, which I could not believe because I thought I just had this assumption that people who are professors in higher education are just sort of their lone wolves, you know, and they just got to do their own thing and do their research. But they didn't. They were asking for community, which I had not built into my business at all at that point. And they liked webinars. And I said, OK, I can work with this. And so I decided in December I was going to launch a virtual conference that was a series of webinars that were put together strategically. And I was going to build a community around it, exactly what they asked for. So I knew I wanted it to be virtual. Um, I didn't want to deal with, you know, hotel rooms and all of that stuff. So this was in December before COVID. So this is, you know, me planning my, my conference. I'm moving along. I'm hiring speakers. I'm figuring out the content, doing all the things, getting <laughs> yeah. sponsors, you know, everybody's chugging along. Then March comes along and it's like, bam, here we go. We're shutting down higher education, <laughs> you know, we're moving everything online. And I was just like, oh, wow, this is either going to go really good for me or really, really bad. Like mm -hmm. everybody's going to be so burned out on virtual stuff. And this was in March and my conference was in June. And I said, okay, I'm just going to keep plowing ahead. You know, I'm just going to keep doing it. And so I kept planning it, kept marketing it. Um, I, I adjusted the price a little bit because of COVID and just, you know, did the best that I could with that. And it was my most successful event that I've done for my business in nine years. So I'm very thankful. <laughs> we had 352 participants um, from around the world. Yeah, I was just I just, I, my goal was 30, right? My goal was 30 participants. Oh, 10X. <laughs> Great card owner would be very happy with you. Do you 10X yeah. it? Yeah. Uh, well, and you know, from a, a business perspective, um, I, I didn't have to pivot my conference like everybody else did who was having conferences in higher education Indeed. because I was already planning it. So those who had physical conferences in higher education, which is what all of our conferences were prior to COVID, um, you know, they were having to scramble quickly or reschedule or cancel. And so my conference was still there. And I was like, okay, maybe I can, you know, maybe this will be successful. And so I really enjoyed it. Um, I don't know how deep you want to go into the conference, oh, but I'd love to go deep into the conference. Yeah. Okay. Like what it took to run it, what you learned, all that. Yeah. So what I do stories? have, um, I, in your show notes, I can put, I'll send you a link to, um, a free, uh, uh, just a blog post, an article that I wrote about 12 questions that everybody needs to ask before you launch your own virtual conference. They're the same 12 questions that I planned. And, uh, I started just thinking, okay, I'm going to do, you know, some zoom just zoom I'm going to record it on zoom it's going to be live um and I realized quickly that I had to scale up once I got 300 people I was like oh you know I gotta I gotta figure this out but basically here's the format so it was in June it was held for three days a Tuesday Wednesday Thursday um we ran from 12 to 4 every day I had three speakers each day so Nice. Um, I didn't have tracks and didn't get all confusing mm. like that. I'm like my first conference, everybody's going to have the same speaker for the same amount of time. Um, so I had three speakers each day and those speakers went for 45 minutes each. And then there was about a 20 to 30 minute break in between sessions. Um, I... Uh, I also did a bonus um, session that was me that I had pre-recorded and I put that into, I uh, used Teachable um, at the time and put all the recordings in there so people could go in there and access those at any time. I gave them 30 days access to all conference materials after. Uh, they could earn a badge, which I mentioned. I had about 12 sponsors. Um, so, and I, and I gave all the speakers uh, like a free sponsorship package as well as paying them to be a speaker. And so, you know, we used Zoom for the sessions. I used yep. Teachable for the recordings and I used Mighty Networks for my community. Oh, I was going to um, ask that question. Yep. Yeah. Which has pros and cons. Um, if, if I do it again next summer, I would not use Mighty Networks because I'd really had some trouble with the tech. Um, but the, the participants loved it. Like they loved that piece. And that piece was, I, I couldn't even keep up every day with all the conversations, which was amazing. Um, that's exactly what they wanted. Yeah, because I see like um, a lot of virtual conferences that have the community feature, they find it really hard to create the dialogue. And so, so what do you think it was with your group in particular? Is it because they were all rallied around the fact that 
they can't now educate in person? Like, was it, was it because I had struggles at the same time and they were all working from home? Like, what do you think it was that sparked? The- yeah, I think it could be, uh, I cannot take credit for all of this by any <laughs> okay. means, but I think it was an early virtual conference. So, you know, if we're mm-hmm. looking at the trend of the year, um, it was a, it was one that came in pretty early um, because we closed down higher ed in, in March. And then this conference came in June. A lot of people, their conferences were in the fall, you know, like now. And so uh, I think being kind of an early bird in that space, um, at least in my niche, uh, worked to my advantage. Uh, but the other thing too is, is educators are just very engaging and very excited about what they do. And this type of, of conference format, I think, um, you know, I had a lot of chat. The chat was on fire every day. I just, we, even Amazing. all of my speakers said, Barbie, I can't believe this. I can't believe how engaged this audience is. Yeah. Um, I chose my speakers. This is an important point. I chose my speakers based on my most popular downloaded podcast episodes. So I invited those guests back to be the, the, um, to lead like a session so they could go beyond their podcast episode. And so I knew that that would probably generate a lot of interest and they were amazing. My speakers were incredible and I did everything I could. If they had businesses, I was promoting their work and their business and everything three weeks ahead of time before the conference. I was really trying to stir up some excitement. Um, I was asking my community questions. I opened Mighty Networks three weeks ahead of time, just really tried to get that engagement before it even started. And I think that had a lot to do with kind of building that space. Yeah, I love that you opened the community three weeks early to build that momentum. Did you have any help doing this or was it you just doing like all the <laughs> emails and like, really? Wow. That was just me. I did not know what I was getting myself into <laughs> at the time. Like, well, I was just really, like, I'm doing it. <laughs> and if you got like 30 people, you could easily do that. But you're like, yeah, 300. Oh my gosh, I love that. It just shows yeah, like look- how I'm so excited. Like this, honestly, Barbie, like when I'm listening to this, I'm like, I want to run my own virtual summit now. But yeah, it. Well, I'm going to do... I'm going to do some more writing around that. So that first article that I, that I'll, you can link in the show notes, that's kind of the preparatory part. Then I want to talk about all the tech that I used and some of the hiccups along the way, things to prepare for. Um, I just, uh, I think it's all about, you know, picking your speakers. And I served as the host throughout the entire event. So I was monitoring that chat, being that link between my speakers and my audience and just trying to, to really monitor that and, and do the best that I could. But it was, um, it was just really effective. And I think it's really important to choose who your speakers are and to make sure that you know your role that day because if you're going to be a speaker too you got to have somebody else who's going to you know monitor that chat I did hire um, a tech assistant because I could not do that I couldn't manage people's <laughs> tech I can't hear I can't see the screen or whatever so I did hire a tech assistant for those those three days yeah that's so really recommend cool. that yeah oh totally totally um yeah but timing is really important as well I remember, I think I'm trying to think about what I was like in June, but I remember when COVID first hit uh, March, April, May, like honestly every week, I think I signed up to like three webinars a day because all of my favorite people in the world were doing free webinars. And I'm like, I just want right. to, and like, I didn't catch up on all of them now. I've got webinar fatigue because I'm now doing sure. my own, like running them as well. Let's talk about then. Uh, so you got very comfortable running virtual sessions through Zoom, through your summit. Um, how are your educators uh, going with, and, and yourself included, now pivoting your business? You said you used to travel last year. You're doing a lot of your stuff online now. How are you finding that? Have you learned anything that's that's different, that is challenging? Like, what are your thoughts of pivoting everything you do to... Yeah, well, you know, I feel like, so I've, I've always had online courses as part of my business since like the second or third year I started it. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've always had that and and that was there and through Teachable and and that was great. You know, that was running, it was fine, um, but it wasn't the caliber I wanted it to be. I wanted that engagement and that connection and that community. I just didn't know how to do it. And so the conference helped with that. And then the everybody transitioning to, you know, the online space after COVID has given us a lot of new ideas, a lot of research that's out there now, experiences that people are sharing. We know what's working, what's not working. Um, I, I am a little worried about the Zoom fatigue. Um, I'm hearing that a lot in, in higher education and in my space as well. Um, and I think that's going to have a huge effect on, on, you know, virtual conferences going forward. I, I don't know, you know, it's going to be really interesting. I don't know. Higher ed is traditionally this very 
face-to-face uh, -face type of environment. And, and now the whole industry, the whole profession has pivoted. And I don't know if there's going to be this weird, um, that's not weird, uh, this backlash or this need to get back in person and get back to the in-person conferences and get back to the in-person classroom. Mm. I'm not sure if it's going to go that direction or if people have learned that, wow, look at all the things we can do in the virtual space and how we can keep making it better. It's more convenient. I'm, I can, I'm able to do, you know, three sessions or, you know, like those of us who do speaking for a living, for example, you could do three keynotes in a day where you could, there's no way you could do that if you were getting on the airplane, trying to go to three cities. Um, and so it's going to be really interesting to see which way this falls. And I'm not sure yet. I think I still like the combination of the in-person and the online. I really like the online space, but I got to, I, I want to learn more about it and how to keep it engaging. Yeah. In Australia, we're uh, well, where I live at the moment, we're seeing uh, things sort of, things are kind of normal, but uh, in terms of workshop space, you can't have many people in the same room. So you've got to look at, you know, different height. people are sitting in the same building, but in two different rooms. So it's still kind of like a virtual, a weird hybrid thing. That's yeah. a tough one to figure out as well. Like um, if it's, yeah, I don't know, like how do you include everyone if it's a hybrid experience? Because the people already in the same room have they, you know, the, the upper hand because they can just really talk to each other. Yeah, I've done a couple of podcast episodes on that because yeah. I I'm I'm not in that I'm not teaching in those in the college classrooms right now and I'm not teaching in in person and so I couldn't really connect with that so I invited some some other educators to come on the show and talk about some strategies on how they're doing that. I'm definitely not the expert. So people are making it work, but it's really frustrating. It's getting really frustrating for for those of us who are leading these things to figure out how to do that really well. And so mm -hmm. I think I need to be an all or none. Like it needs it needs to either be all in the same, you know, in-person space or not in the in-person space we're going to go online that's just mm. the way that I facilitate I think I'll be very stressed out and not a good facilitator if I had to balance all the all the moving parts you yeah know, and still try to be effective so but that's just me personally but it's going to be really interesting to see how this falls I really like the flexibility of of building my business more towards an online model um and and you know but I love to speak and facilitate in person. So I, I don't know if I can let that go. We just got to wait till after things settle down. Yeah. Yeah. The question is when it's uh, right. Yeah. <laughs> but like, so um, as I talk to you, you talk about you, you've been in business for nine years, you've run the virtual summit, you've got a book out, you're a keynote speaker. You do, you're doing a lot of different things. I'm 18 months into this and I'm looking at you going, I want to do what Barbie's doing. Like so cool that you're doing all, everything. Uh, how do you personally manage uh, your, your own professional development? So being great at the, the work that you teach and also the business side of things uh, and just like living life. Like how do you incorporate like, cause you, you're doing an awful lot. Like, how do you manage your time? That's probably the key question. Yeah. Well, you know, I did not do it all at once. I started in 2011. I was working full time on a, on a university campus, um, you know, doing my thing there and, and decided I wanted to try to just, you know, see if I could speak, do some kind of speaking and facilitation uh, beyond that one campus. And so, you know, I put up a little website, um, wrote a little blog post, little article about who I am, that kind of thing, and said, here's the things I speak on. Um, the first thing that I did outside of my own business was I wrote a guest blog post. And that blog post um, was, uh, it was for a, an organization that already had a mailing list of, you know, 200,000 subscribers. Wow. And so they picked okay. it up and they said, you know, I had reached out to them and said, can I, you know, do you accept this kind of article? And they're like, absolutely. And that started it. So from that, that launched my business. Um, that one, that one pod, that one um, blog launched my business. And um, from that, I got an invitation uh, to do a keynote session for a campus in Indiana. And there were 300 faculty in attendance. It was a huge event for my first, <laughs> my yeah. first one. <laughs> Um, but you know, I, I loved it and I was like, oh, this is, this is what I want to do. And that, that was the first time I had been on an airplane. It's the first time. I mean, it was a whole lot of firsts going on right there. Amazing. Um, yeah. And so since then that was in 2011. So since then I've been all over everywhere, <laughs> but, um, but that's how it started was with that one blog post connecting with a, a organization larger than mine. And that gave me the exposure. And from that, I mean, two years later, I was invited to do um, a paid um, conference a keynote for the organization that I wrote that blog post for a series of courses. They're the ones who published my book. Like it just became, no the, you know, I owe that 
I mean, I took that opportunity, but I owe that platform uh, for for helping me launch that business. But it did not start with all the things. It started with a blog (laughs) post. (laughs) And from there, I did a lot of speaking as I could and then moved into, um, let's see, what did I do after that? Uh, I guess that's when I really started writing, doing a lot of writing, writing books. And then from there, moved into um, the online courses. And the, the most recent thing I've done is the podcast and the conference. So, you know, we're talking about nine ah, years, you know, yeah, of spreading yeah. all that out. Yeah, it's interesting where people start because like I've started, like the podcast was what I started when I was working internally. And then now moving into online courses. So it was like sort of going the other way. <laughs> well, you know, in 2011, we didn't have like uh, podcasts were still new kids on the block. You know, I mean, there weren't that many. And uh, I remember Pat Flynn was the first podcast that I listened to while I was putting my, um, I was, I was pregnant at the time it was 2014. I was, I was arranging my nursery and putting all my, my baby's clothes up and everything. And I'm like, I'm just going to listen to this podcast. I don't even know what a podcast is. Hooked me right there. And that's, that did it. And within 10, 11 months, I was launching my, my business full-time, like left my full-time job to do my business. I did not know about podcasts until then, until 2014. I think if I were doing it now, I would start with podcasting over blogging. Um, mm-hmm. I think podcast is a, a much more powerful platform. So I think you're doing a great job. You're doing a great job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Bobby. <laughs> it's always nice to get some validation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's when, and Pat Flynn was the first podcast I listened to as well. But that was in 2016. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So he's changed our lives. He really has. He's, he's an awesome guy. I talk about him all the time on the show as, as, uh, yep. as inspiration. And, I and so- I've, I've been, I've been to so many other things, um, you know, so many other spaces where they do this kind of work and I just don't connect the way that I do with, with Pat. He, his work is authentic and I've put it into action and it's been working, you know, some things I have to adjust, but, but yeah, I agree with you that, that it's, it is life-changing. Yeah. And I love that you said, because anyone that is thinking about pivoting and doing their own thing, I think that was a key message is it doesn't have to be your own platform and just seek out where your audience is hanging out and do like offer up your expertise to them. And I love that one blog article, and that's a cool moment, two years later, the full circle, that book and everything else, it, it just shows yeah. the power of networks as well. So it, it does. It does. And, you know, if, if ever you want to talk about a pivot, which could be a totally separate episode, I did make a pivot in my business, huge pivot um, about three years ago. Um, and so uh, my brand prior to this was Flip It Consulting. And the flipped model is a classroom model that you use where you talk about active learning, student engagement. And I've consulted with some businesses that wanted to do flipped training training and development. Um, so that's that approach. And I had used that and, and, you know, created all of that and built that. And then I noticed that I needed, I needed to pivot. It was time. More people already knew about this model. They were already doing it. And so I pivoted and shifted my whole brand around my name, uh, barbiehoneycutt.com. That way I could open up and do other things, not just that one type of teaching strategy. And then that led to the podcast where lecture breakers does not lend itself to any particular style. You can bring in lots of different things under breaking up lectures, not just one one type of model. And so, um, you know, that's a whole nother story, but that's just like a quick snippet of, <laughs> of that, that, you know, what you start with might not be what you finish with and that you just got to keep going, just keep going and, and not giving up on it that way, you know, and, and listening to your audience, I could see what was happening. I could hear what was happening and say, okay, it's, um, it's time to, to pivot this. So, um, that's what I did about three years ago. Yeah. And I love it. You, uh, listening is a very common theme. You mentioned that that was that email that you send out once a year about listening to your audience, what they want, and you listen to that, gave them what they want and you, you got the success from it. And also just that point on um, personal brand, because I'm the same as you. Like I've like, I've tried all these different things. I love doing a lot of different things. So I just sort of go with leannehughes.com and it gives right. us the flexibility to sort of listen and, and pivot when we need to. Right. And, and within that, I still have Flip It Consulting within the Barbie yeah, Honeycutt.com cool. brand. And I still have people asking me to come and do workshops about that, but that's not the main thing that I do. And so, um, so yeah, so just um, a piece of advice there for listeners who might not really know where to start, just, you know, pick something and run with it. Love that. Uh, just talking to you, Barbie, you're a really succinct and clear communicator. Like you just, you're very good at it. You, you sound very you. confident. Uh, have you worked on that skill? Have you always been this, had this ability to communicate? It just comes across like yeah. awesome. Wait, like, yeah. yeah. In college, no, in college, the public speaking class scared me, <laughs> scared me to death. Yeah. Um, but no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, 
I, uh, let's see, I, I, I really have honed my speaking skills just by doing these workshops and starting, you know, on the campus at the time that I was working with and doing workshops for, for educators and faculty and professors and just kind of kept practicing. And I would, I, I would watch speakers, you know, online, you can watch Ted talks, you can watch whatever, but I'd also really pay attention to that when I go to conferences or, you know, observe teachers in classrooms. And I'm like, Oh, this is amazing. How are they doing that walking around the room? They're not even lecturing at the group, you know, what's happening here. And that really opened the door for me to kind of learn, you know, from the pros, from the masters out there. Um, I will say the first time I remember it, I remember it as clear as day, the first time that I was introduced to this idea that to be a presenter or facilitator, you don't have to stand on the stage behind this microphone. It was the first day of graduate school when I was a master's student, my very first day. And we had this uh, big orientation for, you know, welcome to graduate school. Here's all the things <laughs> that you need to know. There was one session in there about teaching, being a TA, a teaching assistant. And I was going to be a teaching assistant, so I needed to learn how to do this. And there were two facilitators at the time, Rich Felder and Rebecca Brent, and they um, they immediately engaged us from the start. This this room had 400 people in it. And I felt like I knew half of them because of so much that we did together. And that was the first time that I'd ever seen somebody facilitate something like that. And they are my mentors and have been on my podcast now. So we have kept this relationship going and I learn from them so, so much all the time. Um, so I, I guess just watching others and you know when it hits you like, oh, this is the kind of thing I want to do. And so um, that was the moment just, uh, and so since then I've just, tried to facilitate, you know, as much as I can get many opportunities to co-facilitate early on um, and just kind of hone my style and, and kind of go from there. Um, so I don't know if that helps anybody, but I have not taken any kind of formal class or anything like that. I could probably benefit from that. <laughs> <laughs> you sound awesome. And I, I love that you share that story. And I also have that memory of like the first time I was like enraptured in a workshop and, and Dr. Catherine Lloyd, she's been on the podcast a couple of times, still keep in touch with her. And a few other people that have been my sort of facilitation heroes, they've all been on the show. Uh, yeah. so it's nice that we can sort of share that um, with the world and that, that. that memory. Yes. I know. I think it's so nice, like that full circle. And then hopefully that inspires other people, right? It's yes, it's just amazing. So is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners on facilitation, on business growth? I mean, we've covered so many topics, virtual summits, Wow. Um, I don't think so. I think we, we did cover a lot of topics. I guess my biggest thing is just, um, you know, just to try not to change everything you do all at once. And, you know, while you and I both have learned from our mentors or other facilitators out there, we still craft our own style and integrate it into the way that, that we work. So you're not trying to copy someone else and be, you know, someone else. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I guess that would be my biggest thing. If you're going to break up your, your training or break up your presentation or your lectures, depending on what you do, uh, take a piece of that and, and try to change or tweak it and then see how it goes, see how it feels. And, you know, some of the things that I do might not work for some of your listeners, for example, and some of the things they do might not work, you know, and so, um, you know, work for me. And so I guess that's just what I'm saying is just to try to, to start small um, and not change everything all at once and just start to slowly integrate these little things into the way you facilitate any training or do any speaking and then see, you know, how that feels to you. Yeah, I love that. And if you are listening to the show, what I'd love to do, pause this episode right now, three, two, one. So what are three things yeah. that you've learned from, so is it three things, what are three things you've learned from Barbie in this conversation? What were two, two things, things you already knew? Uh -huh. And what was number one? And one question uh, that you still one question you still have. And yeah. take that question and post it to, you know, like if you have comments, um, Leanne, in somewhere where you post your podcast, or if you have Facebook group or whatever, you post that question in there because it'd be kind of cool to see what people are asking. And that could be future podcast episodes, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, definitely. You're so yeah. clever with that. Yeah, picking up, listening, getting the question and communicating it back. Um, yeah. Bobby, where can people find you if they'd love to know more or throw that one question? back at you. Oh yeah. So uh, you can learn more at barbiehoneycutt.com, which is B-A-R-B-I honeycut.com. Um, and then also, if you want to listen to the podcast, it is geared towards uh, professor, uh, professors, higher education, college teaching. But a lot of these strategies, like the one I just shared, three, two, one, go for any environment. So you can listen in there and, and pick up on some of those. And so that is lecturebreakers.com and it's available on all podcast platforms. Amazing. Barbie, it's been wonderful to connect with you, hear your yeah. story, hear your business tips, virtual summit, all of that, and, and just ways of making what we do more engaging. So thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for having me. 
Thank you so much for joining the end of the podcast club. It's great to have you here. Hey, the show continues to grow because of you. Thank you so much for sharing the show. And if you like this one, share the love with others and let's collectively get rid of boring workshops forever. It can totally be done. Hey, if we're not connected, I'd love to connect with you. Uh, send me your request over on LinkedIn or follow my behind the scenes stuff over on Instagram at Leanne Hughes. Chat to you next week.